Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dracon. Uh, I am Kyle Kerwin. I'm the CEO and co-founder here at Big Eye. And I'm Igor Grasnov. I am the co-founder and CTO at Big Eye. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I hope you're going to have a great day. We have a jam-packed schedule with a ton of awesome speakers. Uh, Igor and I are going to kick things off today by talking about the state of data reliability engineering before we turn it over to our host for the day, Dimitrios, to introduce our first speaker. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I want to thank uh, the uh, speakers today. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so I want to thank all of our speakers today. And, and I also want to uh, say a special thanks to our sponsors, Snowflake, SelectStar, Portable, Census, Data Quality Camp, Arise, and Caster for helping to make today possible. Uh, but on the next slide, uh, what I really want to do the most is thank all of you for attending. Dracon is for you. We've had over 2,000 people attend Dracon in the last couple of years. This is our third year hosting the conference. And it's really the community of folks in data that are excited about reliability and bringing engineering principles to reliability and data quality that makes the conference worth putting on. So huge shout out and thanks to you for joining us today. I hope that you have a great day hearing from a variety of speakers. Um, but first, let's hand things over to Igor to talk a little bit about what data reliability engineering is. Uh, thanks, Kyle. Uh, so. All of you here uh, are here obviously to learn a little bit more about data reliability engineering. And I'd love to open the show by talking a little bit about what uh, DRE is, how we got here and where are we today and where is the field going in the next couple of years or at least where I would hope that it's going. So uh, on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about how we even got here. Um, it, data engineering has followed a very similar path to what software engineering has followed. Um, there was a revolution in infrastructure around software engineering with the advent of cloud computing. AWS, uh, Google Cloud uh, made it very, very, very simple to deploy applications at, at massive scale. And in order to do that, in order to um, manage those applications, in order to uh, build them, there were a number of frameworks that came about. You had uh, Git and Gradle and uh, Puppet to manage deployments and infrastructure uh, at scale and get things out and robust and scalable. But with on this whole proliferation of applications and uh, services, there uh, became a problem of knowing what are those services even doing. And that is where observability entered the picture for software engineering through the likes of Datadog, New Relic, AppDynamics, uh, PagerDuty, and really started a whole movement around site reliability engineering. How do you know that your applications are up and running and doing the things that you want them to do? In the data engineering world, a lot of the same trends have happened over the last 15 years or so. The cloud uh, data warehouses have become a, a ma massive part of the ecosystem between Re Redshift, Snowflake, and BigQuery, Databricks. Um, cloud frameworks and cloud ETL tools like Fivetran, Stitch, and the like have made it very easy for us to get data into, um, into the system. DBT, uh, Airflow, Daxter have made it very easy for us to run transformations on that data and model it and put it and have data in a way that makes sense to the users. And because there is now so much more data, so much more readily available uh, within your data warehouse and your data stack, there became a need for data observability in the data stack. And that is where um, companies like ourselves, Big Eye, Great Expectations, Monte Carlo are, exist to help you understand what does your data look like? Is it working in the way that you expect it to work? So on the next slide, we can see what SRE is. So SRE, and this is a quote from, um, from the uh, godfather of SRE. Google, obviously, um, their SRE team wrote the SRE book to be, uh, begin with. And they talk about SRE as doing work, automating work that is typically done by operations team and making that um, 
making the SRE team responsible for things that operations engineers used to do. So things like making sure that uh, your services are available, that they're responding in a meaningful amount of time, uh, they're efficient, there's good change management and debugging processes, and obviously capacity planning and what that means for your infrastructure. How many servers am I going to need in AWS? Now, on the next slide, you can see that a DRE is a lot of the same principles around making it easier to automate what humans used to do uh, to make sure that your data is reliable, but turning that into tooling and turning that into processes that can be repeatable over time. And so the difference here uh, is very, very, very um, little. If you add the word data in front of every single area of responsibility of an SRE team, that is really the responsibility of a data reliability engineering team because data also has availability, latency, performance. There are processes around data change management. There's processes around responding to data issues. And obviously you don't want your snowflake bill to explode. So you probably need to do a little bit of capacity planning and figure out how much uh, data you're actually going to need and to store, to process um, and manage those costs. So data reliability engineering is taking this, um, a lot of these concepts from site reliability engineering and making them um, applicable to the data space. And the next question you might ask is, well, why now? Why are we talking about data reliability engineering um, in this day and age? Yes, there's a lot more data, but why is now the right time for this? And then on the next slide, you can see that, um, uh, you can see the different principles that SRE brings to us and why these principles are going to be important. So SRE talks about seven principles, embracing risk, studying standards, reducing toil, monitoring everything, using automation, controlling releases, and favoring simplicity, and applying these principles to create scalable, reliable software systems. On the next slide, you'll see that DRE, going back to it, is the same principles applying it to creating reliable data systems. And the best way that we found to phrase this is treating data quality like it is an engineering problem, making sure that all of the data applications that you have, all these data products are reliable, can be trusted by your business, and still have that culture of high velocity, high iteration on these data products themselves, because you're so certain that they are doing the things that you want them to do and having the data that you want them to have. So next slide, we can see a little bit about where the data stack lives and really that final answer to why are we talking about this now? As I alluded to before, infrastructure has, is a solved problem in the data space today. You can swipe a credit card, you can get a data warehouse, swipe a credit card, get five trend running. I've done this myself at Big Eye. We, our whole data stack is mostly running off of a corporate credit card right now. It's amazing how far we've come in the last five to seven years on this. And I'm sure a lot of you can concur to that. Um, but what we see a lot of teams doing is jumping straight from that infrastructure from, oh, great, I have a hundred different tables in my warehouse. I wanna do a, some cool analytics and I wanna build some ML models and I'm gonna revolutionize my business by getting some insights that I haven't thought of before. And we're gonna uh, start up whole new product lines and that's a great outcome. That's a great goal to have. And that is why we do the things that we do with data. That is why we actually um, store this data, process it, do um, all of this computation in order to drive the business forward, in order to answer questions that we um, didn't even know we had before, but are very meaningful for our uh, business operations. But the step that everybody seems to skip is that middle layer between the infrastructure and the, the solutions. It's that operational layer. It's about understanding where is the data? Who owns it? Who knows about it? What does it look like? How do I query it? What does it relate to? How reliable is it? Can I trust it? If I query a table, how often is it up to date? Because I can tell you from my own experience, there are plenty of tables where you should just assume it's wrong unless someone's telling you that it's right rather than the other way around. And that is not a great place to be. And because 
the, of the scale and the volume of data and the importance of data to the organization, this operation layer really needs to get invested in right now. And we see a lot and a lot of organizations talking about investing into the operations uh, layer. And therefore, that's why I think there's just so much interest around data reliability engineering today, obviously why a lot of you are here. And I'd love to uh, take a quick moment to talk about for the reliability aspect of operations, uh, data operations, where are we today? And so on the next slide, we can, uh, we're going to start talking through a little bit of what does data reliability engineering look like, look like today and where is it headed next? So on the next slide, you'll see a set of concentric circles. So the outermost circle is the circle that I was just talking about. It's that data operation circle. It's everything that is encompassed around how do you manage data at scale? How do you um, do work with data at when there's a lot of data and when there's a lot of consumers and producers of that data? Accountability, change management, search and discovery, um, data quality, tracking usage, documentation. Th these are very, very, very broad concepts that then get narrowed down into uh, smaller domains. And data reliability engineering is one of these domains. It talks about ensuring the reliability of your data. And finally, within data reliability engineering, a large portion of this is actual data observability. And so on the next slide, we are going to zoom in exactly on this uh, area. This is the topic of discussion for today, all of data reliability. And of course, coming from Big Eye being a data observability platform, I need to start with the nearest and dearest to my heart of data observability. And so on the next slide, you can see that in the data observability world, things are actually going fairly good. We seem to, the community seems to be aligning around concepts uh, that are important to data observability, collecting metrics and understanding the state of your data, collecting metadata about when tables load, what they look like, what schema, when the schemas are being changed. These are solved problems. I mark these as green in the diagram because for the most part, everyone has well understood these concepts and knows how to implement solutions for them. Alerting and lineage, a little bit less solved, but still there's quite a bit of work being done here today. We can uh, detect, there's a lot of anomaly detection going on, automated, there's a lot of manual anomaly detection, just raw rules about what your data should look like, and sending those alerts to the right users seems to be starting to really solidify, and there seems to be best practices in the industry around how do I, what do I send notifications about and how and to whom? Lineage is very important in order to understand where the problem is coming from, what it's impacting, and the lineage on across tables, dashboards, uh, DBT jobs, that's really starting to uh, become table stakes from a um, observability perspective. But there's still a lot of space left in the lineage territory because of the variety and distribution of tools that are available to us. We There are still lots and lots of organizations that are using legacy, legacy ETL tools, homegrown ETL tools. Maybe you're writing just custom Python or Spark jobs that are transforming your data. There's no way to automate that lineage. And so how can we start thinking about collecting this information out of that tribal knowledge um, of the organization and putting it into the tools where it will have the greatest impact. Still a, a, some work to be done there, but we're definitely on the right track. Now, if you look uh, at the next slide, you'll see some of the parts where um, our data reliability engineering, not just the observability portion of this, but the overall topic of how to ensure the data is reliable and uh, where we're making progress, data pipeline automation, so observability is great to monitor the data as it lands into your warehouse, but pushing that automation up into the pipelines, having a release process for your new data sets. This is a concept that's starting to materialize. There's starting to be discussions around putting tests closer to the pipeline. Observability is uh, what, typically once it's uh, landed in the warehouse, how do we push things up? How do we create processes around deploying new data sets? How do we stop pipelines if something's broken? Your data pipeline might be five steps. And if the second one breaks, what do you do? Do you notify and stop? Do you notify and continue? Do you 
um, pull out bad records automatically. These are things that are still uh, up in the air. Also, data incident management processes. When something happens, what do, what do we do? As I mentioned in the alerting section, there are some core parts of this that are being solidified, but for the most part, what we're seeing is everyone in the industry has their own concepts of how to deal with data problems uh, and what the process should be. So a, a thing to look out here uh, for are things like run books and um, data reliability teams that actually solidify these processes for the rest of the organization. And finally, on the next slide, we see the part that uh, DRE really, we haven't come a long way at all. And a lot of this boils down to automation. SRE talks a lot about automating the things that humans used to do. DRE needs to work on automating the things that um, analysts used to do, that data engineers used to do. How can we automatically backfill? How can we automatically uh, remove broken data? How can we uh, create runbooks that can be automatically applied by the orchestrator rather than by a human going in and writing some SQL? There is has been very little work done here, very nascent uh, space, uh, part of data reliability engineering, and also very, um, again, very niche to every organization. Different teams have different ways of um, automating, different levels of automation, different ways of automating their processes. And finally, the accountability portion of data reliability. What are my SLAs on my data pipelines? What am I committing to back to the business? There's a lot of talk nowadays about data products and treating data as a product. And products have SLAs. Product, I sign contracts all the time with our uh, customers. I saw as a, a customer of other vendors, I sign contracts that tell me this product will be available X percent of the time, usually 99.9. .9. And if it's not, I can do something about that. I can, I have some recourse. That concept doesn't really exist in the data world today. There's no recourse. The table's late, the table's late, and someone looks at you and says, well, that kind of sucks, check back tomorrow. And that's a really, really different place to be in compared to uh, where software is. And that is an area that I'm interested in seeing what starts coming out of this as standards for building SLAs around data products uh, in the space. So this is this is a little bit of a preview about where uh, we see the data reliability engineering space being, how it's developing, and sort of what's what's coming up next, and what we're excited about. And with that, uh, I will hand it off to Kyle to talk a little about looking ahead on what DRE can be in the coming years. Thanks, Igor. So as Igor mentioned, DRE is still in this sort of formational stage, and we see a lot of different practices when we talk to data teams from, you know, we've talked to folks in uh, financial uh, institutions, we've talked to folks at startups, we've talked to folks that are selling B2B software and building data to monitor pipelines for that. Uh, one thing that we're seeing is that across all these different teams, there's a desire to improve pipeline reliability, but there's still a lot of variety in how they're approaching that. Uh, so as we go to the next slide here, what we'll see is that DRE as a practice and as a process is about where SRE was 10 years ago. So if we just look at Google searches for these topics, we can see that uh, where we are today in search volume for the concept of DRE is about on par with what SRE was doing back in 2013, so literally a decade ago. Uh, so to Igor's point, like we're seeing a lot of forward movement on some topics and processes in DRE and certainly a lot more awareness for it, um, but we're really just at the very beginning. So if you, you look at that blue line there, SRE has really taken off over the years um, and DevOps is now sort of a, a foundational aspect of how software engineering teams work. Really, I think DRE is, is basically at chapter one, kind of where SRE was back in 2013. Um, so I'm really hopeful about the trajectory for DRE in the future uh, and where it's going to take the industry of data overall and bring us sort of out of this, um, you know, early stage that we've been at where things are sort of duct taped together or there's that one person on the team that knows how to fix things. And we'll really start to adopt these systematic practices that we've seen work so well on software engineering teams over the last 10 years. 
Uh, on the next slide, I know one thing that everybody uh, who's thinking about uh, these types of things is curious about, which is, is there an actual title for this or is this just a thing that I do? Uh, and if we look at uh, our friends in software engineering on the upper left there, uh, and it looks like our, uh, our numbers got broken, sorry about that, but uh, these are numbers pulled from a site that aggregates uh, pay for various jobs. You can see the links down there at the bottom left. Um, but these are collected from several thousand job postings, and we see that the average across the United States overall for software engineering salaries is just over $90,000. If we look at site reliability engineering salaries, it's slightly higher. It's $121,000 or just slightly less than that. If we apply that same scaling to data engineering salaries, which for the United States overall are averaging $94,000 per year, we should see a data reliability engineering salary in the future that mirrors the same relationship with the site reliability engineer. And that should, based on the data engineering salaries today, be somewhere around $125,000, $126,000 per year. Now, why is that? It's because of the scarcity of the role. And that's why I think today's content and everybody who's doing the work to push this, uh, this concept forward in the industry, we're creating today what is going to be the SRE category of the future for data teams. Um, and I think as, as we look to software engineering and the increase in salaries for the folks that do this type of work on software teams, I think we'll see the same thing in the future for data reliability engineers as well. Uh, so with that, uh, I want to wrap up our talk today about the state of data reliability engineering. Uh, welcome to Dracon. Uh, I hope you have a great day hearing from our speakers. And with that, it's time to hand it over to Dimitrios, who's going to be our MC for the day. Hey, yo, what's going on, guys? What's up, how's Dimitrios? It, how's it going? I did not realize that it was a collared shirt type affair. I kind of went a little bit more casual per se. I was I was second guessing myself this morning. I'm like, big eye hoodie, collared shirt. I went with the collared shirt. It's a classic. Yeah. And I'll send you over a pink headband so you know for the next one. You can rock this. I mean, while we're on the topic of dress code and the theme of what we're wearing i showed you this before we started i'm wearing this in honor of the event let me see if i can move this hold on bad things happen to good data bad things happen to good data it's true so exactly i felt like it was only right to wear this shirt with you all today because ain't truer words been spoken then bad things happen to good data. And I've got a little story, if you'll permit me to tell you about uh, that we heard on the MLOps community podcast once, and it was how the head of AI for a big company that I'm going to try and not name, it may slip out, there may be some data leakage on this story, but I'm going to try and not name them. They, uh, they were talking about how they spent so many hours and really you got to think about this like gigantic company head of ai is getting into the weeds spending countless hours trying to figure out why there is some table that's broken and the data is not correct turns out that after they debug it which they had to go to every single person who had ever touched the data and figure out what what is going on why is this not matching up because the numbers of the revenue were off and they're sitting there going like, what is going on with the revenue? The finance team has one number and then the marketing team has another number and it's there's a big difference. There's a discrepancy there. They figured out what it was and I, I imagine we could probably poll the audience and they could give us some ideas because potentially they've had this same scenario before, but I'll, I'll jump to the to the ending as not to bore you and wait for you to guess what it was but there was a problem because somebody was typing in revenue in canadian dollars Classic. not in american dollars and they couldn't catch it for the life of them they were all looking at it saying like this is both in dollars what's going on there's there's dollars here there's dollars there it wasn't they they just couldn't figure out that there was those canadian dollars on the one so I mean, you all probably have a million stories like this, huh? I think the the dollars currency conversion that's got to be a classic. If you if you haven't seen that before, I mean, you're going to at some point. 
my favorite was getting some decimals truncated into integers. Uh, somebody mm. saw dollars amount, uh, amounts in, in reporting, and it was kind of suspicious that everything had uh, exactly you know, uh, perfect dollar amounts on it. Uh, and then somebody figured out that they were converting to ints somewhere up in the pipeline. So, uh, oh, currency. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Currency is going to be your best friend as a data reliability, reliability engineer. And I thought that was a... It was an awesome presentation. Thank you guys for putting that together. There were so many good pieces. I love talking about the money and, and talking about how it's really like creating this whole new type of engineer. And I think you may have missed out on the name of this. I mean, I'm not sure why we don't have uh, the Chronic 2001 playing and this could have been Dr. Dracon, maybe for next year. That will be the way that we do it we can we can intro everyone maybe for next year definitely the most popular request for dracon 2024 at this point yes yes so speaking of uh dracon stuff i know there's a ton of people out there that are watching with us i've been a little bit active in the chat i would love to hear where everybody is coming in from where are you tuning in from it's great to see there was already some people saying they're coming from canada they're probably the ones that are entering in those Canadian dollars in the tables and messing up all of the data. And there's also some Brazilians out there. There's some Americans, of course, but let us know, where are you coming from? And we're gonna, I think we're gonna keep on moving and uh, it's time, sadly, I think I may have to kick you guys off now. Are you okay with that? Are you ready for to let go? Just send me a headband <laughs> later. <laughs> exactly i'll send you a headband and a shirt i'm gonna leave one of these shirts i'll i'll leave the link into where you can get this shirt uh in the chat because i see some people are saying that they want some so i've got this one i've also got one that said it's a little bit more mle which is i hallucinate more than chat gpt <laughs> so if you know you know yeah some some of my friends are like i don't get it at all uh and <laughs> So I, I think if you understand, then that's it. So fellas, thank you so much for the awesome keynote. We're going to keep it moving. And next up, we have got my good friend, Chad Sanderson. Uh, I've realized that I didn't even tell you who I am. And so I just got right into it with Kyle and Igor, but I'm Demetrios. I am one of the founders of the MLOps community and I imagine that people, if you're doing data reliability engineering, you know a little bit about machine learning and ML ops. You probably have heard the term before. And so that's what I do. I just sit around and talk about ML ops all day with a lot of people and we have fun doing that. Data engineering is one of those things that it almost falls under ML ops and it almost is something that you can't have good ML ops without data engineering. 